As I was asking the Lord this morning, what do you want to say to these guys, Jesus? He said, tell them I love them. But I don't really understand how much I love them. Let me read that scripture to you. Psalm 68, verse 5. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God wants to teach us as parents about how much he loves us. And everybody that has children has that revelation. As they yearn to gather their little ones in their arms, as they look down at them with such adoration, as they say, oh, marvelous God, what a precious gift. Why did we wait to have children? What a gorgeous little kid. I can't wait to get my hands on you again. So hug you. And you say, God, do you think this way about me? Do you, are you like this, Lord? Are you sort of following me around, wanting to give me a hug? The Lord says, yes. Yes, that's the whole point. God loves me. God loves you. God knows you so well. Think of your name and your identity. God knows you intimately. God desires to walk and talk with you. It's not the knowledge of theology. It's not the increase of ministry skills. But it's a deep, deep sense of God's adoring, doting parenthood over you that really is the ground floor, the foundation stone of who you are as a person, of who you'll be in your relationships with others, and what you'll become as God changes you by His Holy Spirit into the creature that He is making in the image of Jesus, remaking to be like His Son. God, see, is faithful. The Bible says every promise in the book is yea and amen. He fulfills it. What God says He will do, He does. He does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The concrete foundation of all systems of existence is the being of God, and His character is absolutely unshakable. Let not the wise man bask in his might, nor the mighty man in his riches, but let them boast in this alone, that they truly know me, is what the scripture says, that they truly know me, that I am the Lord of justice and righteousness and mercy and that I love to be this way. That's the way it puts it in the Living Bible. That I am the Lord of justice and righteousness and mercy and that I love to be this way. That's the nature of God. He is faithful. He will not leave you alone. What is God like? He is faithful. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He was with you from your first breathing moment. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He looked at you all last night while you were asleep. He sat on the edge of your bed waiting for you to wake up this morning. He wants to walk and talk and fellowship with you through the day. He prayed for you through the night watches. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Rejoice and be glad in it because Jesus is here. Practicing the presence of God is the key to an understanding of His faithfulness. Being aware with the anointed imagination, which is the eye of faith, of Jesus' presence with us as the third person in every conversation. As the person that's sitting in a car with you when you drive by yourself. As the person that comforts you in your loneliness. As a person that enjoys, chuckles along with you in your enjoyments. Do you talk to God about little stuff? Because He's there. The love of God is revealed in the detail of our life. Not the great crossroad decisions of whether we become a missionary in China, Tibet, or Tyler. But it's, where do I find a hairstyle, Lord, that makes me look good? Those acts of faith and dialogue that are concerning things that we would consider as periphery and unimportant. When God involves Himself in that kind of detail, it dawns on us for the first time in our life, hey, hey, He's interested in the way my hair looks. And what we need to do is we need to grab our little children by the face and look in their eyes and say, I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. Make it an obvious statement of their worth again and again and again. If there's a litany of your house, in your household of expression, may it be a litany of love. May it be stated again and again. And if they do break something, don't discipline them in anger. Discipline them in grief. Sit down and say, hey, that was a treasure to me. That's broken my heart. My great-grandmother gave that to my mother. 
And she gave that to me. And you disobeyed me. And now it's broken. And that makes me very sad. That makes me very sad. But what makes me even more sad is that you are disobedient. And you must learn to become like Jesus. And I must discipline you because I am God's child and He disciplines me. And those who love discipline, I must teach you how to live. Therefore, we're going to have a spanking. We're going to have this punishment. You're not having this allowance. We're having these consequences. But discipline and grief. And at that same time, use it as a very illustration of your love. That thing was a treasure to me that you broke. That thing was a treasure to me and my heart is broken. But let me tell you something. As wonderful as that thing was to me, you are so much more valuable and loved to me. Every time something like that is destroyed, we use it as an illustration in contrast. We say, I love you so much more than that thing which I treasure. Yes, you wrecked the car, but I love you, my son, more than that automobile. I love you. God is generous. God is innately extravagant. God has carpeted this planet with the meadows filled with wildflowers. He's walled it with the mountains and draped them with the forests and canopied over this place with the myriads of stars. He has painted the undersea landscape. He's created the beauty and complexity and design of inner space, the magnificence of outer space. Why? He wanted to blow the mind of those who would dwell in the environment that he created with the extravaganza of his love. Because God with an excited heart worked for six days preparing a place for his beloved. God is innately generous. Now you might say, what are you saying? We're all to be prosperous? No. We learn to be abased. We learn to go without. And we learn to abound. But the reason why God cannot heap upon us every kind of possession is that He does not want to reinforce our selfishness. He's made a little rule of thumb. Before I give to them, they must give. Give, and it shall be given unto you. That way He is able to bless us while at the same time reinforcing our character. But God is a generous, extravagant God. God is extravagant. God is generous. Hey, you know what? I expect God to treat me that way. It's not my rights, but it's my expectation. I expect God to be generous toward me. I expect God to constantly blow my mind in the little things. You know, He does all the time. See, you've got a secret pal. His name is God. You're free to be a secret pal to somebody else. To secretly scheme and plot for their blessing. You don't have to worry about yourself because God in heaven the thoughts of the Lord are continually toward you, the Bible says. He is thinking at all times that there is a stream of loving thought going from the mind of Father God toward you as though no one else existed. He's thinking with his fussy, doting parental love about you at this moment. <clears throat> He's considering, how can I bless them? The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro on the earth, looking for a man whose heart is right toward him, that he may use him, that he may bless him, that he may bless him. Well, let's talk about, uh, well, I'll give this one little illustration. My wife likes to buy jewelry. We were one day in Turkey and she dragged me into a jewelry store. She was pregnant at the time and we were all going witnessing, but she couldn't. So she was looking around these little stores and she showed me this opal ring. She said, honey, can we buy this? I said, uh-uh. Well, I don't even have enough money for the airfare out of this country. And I sort of looked at her disgustedly, you know, woman, what are you staring at these baubles for, you know? Came here to serve Jesus. Well, you know what she did? She cheated on me. She totally bypassed my authority. She went to God. <laughs> Obviously, that's not cheating, is it? Let me tell you, gals, no matter what nerd you end up with, you, you still always have God as your true husband and your true father. <laughs> the Bible says in the book, Jeremiah, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. That's a real security, isn't it? So she went to God and said, Oh Lord, I know what she said. She dragged him down there and showed him, Oh Lord, it's only, you know, 35 bucks. It cost 150 back in the States. The next day, we got 35 bucks in the mail designated for her. A little note, it said, This is not to be used for needs. This is for her. 
Well, what can you do? <laughs> Who does she think God is? Her father? Yeah. <laughs> he is. He is. One day there were some people recorded in history future who stand before Jesus. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. And they say, well, what about our ministry? We cast out demons. We healed the sick. We raised the dead. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. In the King James Bible, that word to know is the same word that's used instead of sexual intimacy. It's interesting, isn't it? And so-and-so knew his wife, she conceived and brought forth, etc. Have you ever read that word used in that way in the genealogies there? What's Jesus saying? I don't know if it's the same word. Obviously, it's an Old Testament context and a New Testament context. But it's, it's interesting that the same word would be used in the English translation in both cases. To know. What Jesus is saying is this. Depart from me, you never became my intimate friend. No man comes to the Father but by me. That doesn't, that doesn't mean just giving intellectual assent to the fact that I lived and died for your sins. That means entering into relationship with me. If any man open unto me, I will come in and sup with him. I want to walk and talk and fellowship with him. Depart from me. We never talked about little stuff. We were never friends. We never knew each other. The whole point of redemption was redemption to relationship. Repentance from sin into relationship with me. No man comes to the Father but by me. Not Jesus the theological fact, Jesus the person that's in this room with us right now that we are to walk and talk with, that we're to walk out the door with, that we're to drive down the road with, that we're to fellowship with, that we're to receive comfort from, that we're to give praise and thanksgiving to, that we're to receive counsel from, that we're to share the intimacy of our lives with. You know, we're so servile in our relationship with God. I think that one of the greatest hindrances to our having an affectionate relationship with God is that we do not believe He's affectionate toward us. We do not believe in our own attractiveness. We feel, in short, ugly or unattractive to God. Your sin does make you ugly, but that's like when my kid gets covered in mud. I may carry him over to the hose at arm's length and I might reject the mud. I'll hose it off, but I don't reject the kid. I don't love him any less if he's dirty. I might say, don't get dirty. But that is not rejection, that's instruction. And see, we confuse these things and we think that, oh, we must be so unlovely to God. Sometimes we think, well, maybe He loves my soul and my spirit, but my body, does He love that too? He loves that too. You were born, county hospital someplace, Jesus looked down at you and loved you. He loved you. He's taken delight in your appearance every day of your life. He's made you perfectly from your toenails to your dandruff for the role that He has for you in this life. He has created us for His pleasure, the Bible says. And He has created us in another place, it says in Ephesians, for the good works that He has prepared beforehand. He has designed you to be a blessing that is unique within your generation in everything from your earlobes to your musical ear to your ability to do this, that, and the next thing or your inability to do it. Because remember, in our weakness, the strength is made perfect. Those things are a unique package that God is going to be uniquely glorified through. And if you don't allow Jesus to live your life through you, there'll be a gap. There'll be people unblessed. There'll be needs unmet in your generation. There is no cause for self-pity in the way He has made us. God delights in you as we delight in our own children. Even the drunk in the gutter in San Francisco that has three months to live as cirrhosis of the liver. Is it made in the... Is that face made in the image of the devil? No. It's made in God's image. Child of God by intention, yet, yet not in fact, yet not redeemed, but still beloved of the Lord. Beloved of the Lord. Well, I said that we're so servile in relationships. It's like this. One day I proposed to a beautiful girl and I said, will you marry me? I won't tell you what she said just yet. What if she'd have said, Oh, let me darn your socks. Let me type your letters. Let me wash clothes. Let me clean the car. I didn't want to hear that. I wanted a response in kind. All that other stuff would come later. <laughs> and you know what God does? He comes to us and He says, I love you. 
and we get all servile. We go, oh, uh, let me um, do, uh, let me do, do for, do for, do for. You see, go for, go for. Let me uh, fix and go and evangelize and yes, sir, and plan and what about China and all this kind of stuff. It's, and, he, and we rush from his presence and busyness. We have this little thing, saved to serve. We were not saved to serve. We are saved and we also serve, but that is not the motive in God's heart why He saved us. He saved us to walk and talk and enjoy Him. Hallelujah. To have friendship with God. And partly we do not understand that because we think that God is relating to us in a condescending relationship. Have you ever had a sparrow that flew into the window of your house? And you went out and tried to minister to it. You picked it up in your cupped hands and you tried to, to comfort it in some way. You felt so inadequate because you were so big and it was so small. Sometimes we think God relates to us that way. Great big God, little we us. Hello? See? You all right? Pat, pat. It's not that way at all. Mystery of mysteries. The living God does not relate to you that way. Yes, He is the great God upon His throne. He is high and lifted up. His train fills the temple. We stand in awe of Him. But He is also the friend that sticks closer than a brother. You might think, how in the world can this be? He loves you. We read in the book of Song of Solomon's, Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, Oh, my dove that art in the cleft of the rock, hiding in your insecurity and inferiority, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for sweet is your voice. You think, well, how, is God looking at me right now? Is He really? Is He thinking about me? Most of us don't pray that way. We go, oh God, we change our tone of voice every time we address Him, like we're going, Come and look. He's already looking. The Bible says the thoughts of the Lord are continually toward us. It's no problem for God. He means what He says. He's gazing upon you as though no one else existed at this moment, giving you His full attention. Hallelujah. And I use words like fussy and doting. Sometimes we think of parents that are like that. You know, the Jewish mother force-feeding you with uh, chicken soup. The kind of a mother that's always saying, Are you cold? Are you warm? Are you all right? And sometimes that drives us up the wall. Well, let me tell you something. You've got a problem with God. He's worse than all of them put together. He never leaves you off for sex. He comes on every date. He watches over and prays for you all night. Never takes his eyes off of you. He delights in your appearance. You ever thought about that, your appearance? So many of us do not feel attractive because we live in a performance-oriented society which is always conditional in its acceptance. You do get accepted by your peer group based on your designer jeans and your hair flipped like Farrah Fawcett and your big white teeth or whatever. See that? But God is not that way. He loves us unconditionally with a fussy, doting love. There's two little illustrations in Scripture which are illustrations about ridiculous personal detail. And God has put them in there to tell us this about Himself. One of them is the little statement that He has the hairs of your head numbered. Now, is God really interested in that as a, an inventory mathematical function? I mean, does He have an angelic microchip bag? And every now and again, in going over your file, He says to the angels, Number of hairs, please. I see this is incomplete here. This last entry here was March the 6th, 1967. They can't have the same number of hairs. Please, I need number of hairs. An angel rushes off and computes it all out and gets back 9,430,000. And he writes that down because he likes to keep records that meticulously. Is that what it's in? You know, it's nothing like that. It's just God saying, hey, I know you that well. It's another little statement, too, that talks about the griefs of the children of Israel. The griefs that we have suffered. And it says, I have kept your tears in a bottle. Hey, what God is saying through that is, I treasure the memory of your sorrows. You've forgotten all about your sorrows. I haven't forgotten about them. I wept for your pains. I was there. That time you were a lonely little kid and you were hurt by the cutting words of another little gang of kids in the junior high yard and they said, no, you can't play with us. And you walked away by yourself. You were not alone. Jesus was with you. And you went and walked around the back of the building and tried to be strong and as soon as you got away from everybody's eyes, you bawled your eyes out. 
and Jesus was there. That time you were hurt by a school teacher, you sat there and you couldn't do your spelling and you were confused and they mocked you and they said, you're no good. They picked you out. That time in math class, you couldn't do the sums and you were made a public example of and they even said you were dumb and that's wounded you ever since you've carried that legacy of thinking I have an inability, there's something wrong with me, I can't do stuff. How many times did you sit after school trying to do work that you struggled with? Those many hours is the many hours that Jesus sat with you. He never did leave you nor forsake you. He was always there. That time when you were in sin, the memory of it is shameful. He never turned away from you in that moment. He, he still was there as a persuader. The very next day, he was attempting to tap you on the shoulder and say, I still love you. I'll take you back. You are ashamed of yourself, but I will take your shame upon me. In fact, I have taken your shame upon me. I'll take the guilt of last night and I will take it upon myself. And I will make you newborn, as fresh and clean as a newborn baby. He pursued you in love. The love of Jesus is a love of detail. It's a doting, fussy love. The Bible says in Zephaniah, He will rest in His love. He will joy over us with singing. He will joy over us with singing. Oh, that's the, that's the picture of a little baby in the arms of a loving parent rocking them, hugging them, holding them. You know, the Bible says this. God has something to do with conception. Do you know that in the book of Job? It says He causes the hinds to calf. Now, if God has something to do with conception in animals, how much more does He have to do There's some, with something in humans? There's something marvelous there that comes from Him. My children are not the product of Julie and I. I mean, I see bits of her and bits of me in there physically, but where did the person come from? We didn't make the person. When the Bible says children are a gift from God and the inheritance of the Lord, they are His children, you know. He makes them. We contribute a physical part, but where is the, you know, the being inside that, that manipulates that brain? Where are they? They do not come from... I did not manufacture that. That is a marvelous, awesome thing that I have had a, a joint partnership with God in creating. That's why there's no illegitimate children, just illegitimate parents. Because God has to be involved. There is something that happens supernaturally there in the production of a human life. But we're living in a performance-oriented society. We are received and accepted with excitement. If we have a good report card, or if we make the football team, or if we finally grow front teeth, or if we win the 220, or if we get a new designer body from the health spa, or if we have money to give, or dope to be generous with, or it's always conditional. It's always conditional. It doesn't matter if it's straight society, or hippie society, or, you know, ethnic society, or whatever it is. That's just the way of man. It's performance and competition, always evaluating one another based on an external set of standards. But God is not that way. God loves us unconditionally. What does unconditional love mean? <clears throat> there is no preconditions. Now, unconditional love continues. God's kingdom is a kingdom of acceptance of unconditional love. Now, we can hurt God by our disobedience. I'm not commenting on all of that stuff. But I am commenting on God's love for you as opposed to the love of human authority. Parental acceptance is usually based on some kind of a performance. And what this does is it puts us in a state where we do not really feel comfortable with God's acceptance. We do not feel that He really likes us yet until we've performed, until we've changed our appearance, until we have gotten all dressed up for Him. This is part of the thing that we do when we get all dressed up on Sunday. I'm not saying it's wrong to be all dressed up on Sunday. But it is a, an impression that we do give our children that, you know, we are more acceptable to God in a certain dress and posture than at other times, which is a little bit 
derogatory, actually, for the development and growth in God. I mean, who cares if God's, if you're wearing a bow tie or not? Your bow tie is on top of your Adam's apple and God can see the inside of it. See what I'm saying? Can you see the roof of your mouth right now? You haven't even looked at it ever. Have you ever looked at the roof of your mouth? Not within conscious memory anyway. <laughs> Say, well, God looked at it out. He looked at it this morning. You know, he was sitting there and kind of, all right, the roof of your mouth. Yeah, fine. I mean, he's always, he's a God of detail. He knows what's going on. He can see right into your DNA molecules right now. And getting dressed up for God appears to me as ridiculous in the light of that. Now, I'm saying, yes, be well dressed. I'm not making a comment on our, because that's a loving thing in our human relationships, to be as attractive as we can and well-groomed as we can. But don't carry that over into your relationship with God, you see that? God is not a God that rewards us with closeness to Himself based on our performance. He would love to be close. In other words, you don't have to wait to get close to God. You say, well, I'm not mature yet. I don't know the word yet. I have habits and appetites yet. I have lousy attitudes yet. Never mind. Don't postpone fulfillment. Don't postpone the presence of God to way out in the future when you become a man of God or something. Jesus is with us today. It's, you don't have to wait till heaven. You can walk, with, walk and talk with God now. Fulfillment is the water of life who is Jesus. He didn't say to the woman at the well, These are all the conditions. The condition is that we follow Him. Now, He transforms us when we follow Him. But He doesn't say, get yourself totally cleaned up, then come into my presence. He says, hey, follow me. I will make you. He doesn't say, follow me, then make yourself. The Holy Spirit... He will bring to your remembrance. He will teach you all things. It doesn't say we will guide us into all truth. It says He will guide us into all truth. Hallelujah. You know, many years ago, I was walking up and down in my apartment, and I was all bummed out and discouraged. I needed about 9,000 bucks for a project I was involved with in YWAM. And at that time, that seemed like a, just an insurmountable amount of money. And I was just walking up and down, really in self-pity. And there was a knock at the door. I went and opened it. And it was uh, some girls from over at the Discipleship Training School. And one of the girls said, you know, sorry to interrupt, but we know you're under this pressure. And a group of us have been praying for you. I said, oh, yeah? She said, yeah. She said, um, I got a kind of a vision while I was praying. I said, really? You know, more like a, 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 a spiritual vision? She said, yeah. She said, I saw you in this vision, and you were like a little baby in the arms of the Lord, and He was just rocking you. Well, let me tell you something, friends. Whatever you become in the eyes of man, you will never cease to be more or less than that, a babe in the arms of the Lord. You know, Moses gave a blessing to the tribes of Israel one time. He said to this tribe over here, you shall have abundant crops. To this tribe, you shall overcome your enemies. To this tribe, you shall prosper in commerce. To this tribe, you shall have fortified cities that will not be broken in, or whatever. I can't remember all the other promises that he gave, or blessings. They all were great blessings. They were all spiritual blessings. And they probably weren't the ones I just said. But this one little tribe came before him. I don't know if it was Ephraim or something, but it was a, like, I think Ephraim or Manasseh, one of the little tribes. And, and Moses, by the Spirit of God, just said this little tiny blessing. He just said this. You shall dwell between the shoulders of God. Hey, I'll take that one. They can keep the rest. I'll take that one. You shall dwell between the shoulders of God. Where's that? That's right here. We have a chorus that we sing. It's so good to dwell in the everlasting arms of my Lord. That's not a fantasy chorus. That's a scriptural reality. The Bible says that. Let's say that together. You shall dwell between the shoulders of God. Let's say that together. You shall dwell between the shoulders of God. We do dwell between the shoulders of God. Let's say that. We do dwell between the shoulders of God. God personalize it now. I do dwell between the shoulders of God.
You know, Kari Ten Boom is a woman that has gone through tremendous suffering and been mightily used of God. And as a woman of God that's like Jesus, at the end of her life now, she would give us, as this generation of saints with our life and ministry before us, a simple word of advice gleaned from years and years of service to Jesus. You know what her advice to us is as a generation? It's very simple. It's just this. Don't wrestle. Nestle. Let's say that together. Don't wrestle. Nestle. <laughs> oh, we're so servile. We're so fretful. We're so fussy. We fuss at God. It's like a little kid that won't be hugged, that pushes you away. That says, not now, Daddy. i got to do my thing. I gotta impress you. I gotta ride my bicycle. I don't want a hug. And that hurts. That hurts, Dad. It's like this. Here we all are. <coughs> and we're like we're like little babies in the arms of God. And he's just kind of rocking us. He just got us in his arms and he's just, oh I love you, don't you know? And my Bible tells you so. He's just loving us. He's loving on you. You shall dwell between the shoulders of God. And from the arms of Jesus, you look up into his face with a pensive, worried, concerned look. And you look up at Jesus and you go, Oh, Father, I'm so far from you. And he goes, What? <laughs> How did you get that idea? What in the world are you talking about? You're right here in my arms. And from the arms of Jesus, we point at somebody else. And we say, Look at their ministry. Look at their appearance. Look at their results. Look at their possessions. Look at their gifts. And the Lord says, Shut up. Hush. Shh. Don't fuss at me about what somebody else has. Hey, you're my child. That has nothing to do with... Uh, yes, I've given them those gifts. But that does not make them closer to me. You see, a lot of people think, I want to be a leader. I want to be in ministry because then I'll be closer to God. I'll gain God's approval and acceptance. Oh, yes, you can minister to the heart of God. Wonderfully. Do it. Worship God. Obey God. Minister to the heart of God. But His love for you is not going to be increased by that. His love for you is present now as a, the most overwhelming force in the universe. Yes, you, there are things about us now that are, are like old rags hanging on us. But He looks beyond the rags. He looks upon the wounds. He, he looks, you know, it's like in the Old Testament where He says, Israel is covered in blood. She is filthy. The thing is this though, that filthiness does not hide our beauty to Jesus. If you have any idea how attractive you are to God, oh, let Him clean you up. But don't stay away. And don't compare yourself with another. Don't begrudge the blessings of another. Don't think that that's an indication that you are not favored by the Lord. You're the apple of God's eye. What does that mean? The apple of God's eye, the pupil of the eye. So protected that you yourself won't even touch it. Could he help anybody that would touch the apple of God's eye? That's you. You dwell between the shoulders of God. I love you already, God says. Though you go to the ends of the earth, though there is a thousand that come into my kingdom through the work of your hands and your steps of obedience, you will not be loved any more than I love you this day. Therefore, enjoy me and know me. For I am with you, and I will never leave you or forsake you. And I take the light in you. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. As sweet as thy voice. I'll tell you what we're going to do today as an assignment. I want you to talk to God about little stuff. Can you do that? When you go to sleep tonight, will you just lay your head on the pillow and just sort of go to sleep just like a little one? Because we're all just little ones. We get religiously sophisticated sometimes. The disciples did one time. They came to Jesus one day and they said, Tell me, Lord, uh, who's going to sit on your right and left hand? They had a note from their mother. Another time they came and said, uh, Lord, they've been discussing it among themselves. And they said, Who's the greatest in your kingdom? They were wanting you know, Jesus to basically point out which of the two of them it was. <laughs> Boy, Jesus rebuked them, you know that? He said, except ye repent 
and become as little children, you will not even enter my kingdom. Man, that was a scathing remark. We're not to be childish, but childlike. Childlike. We are just little ones. Oh, if we go out in missionary work, we don't go out as big, tough servants of the Lord. Now we're so mature, we've got the answer for the nations. It's that we go with Jesus. It's that we go with Jesus. He gently leads us. He carries the lambs in his arms. I will carry them in my bosom. I will gently lead those that are with young. You shall dwell between the shoulders of God. Don't wrestle. Nestle. But it's funny when we start talking to him, all of a sudden what we're talking about becomes diminished by who we're talking to. Who we're talking to becomes so exciting and wonderful. Particularly when he talked to me. He talked to me. I was speaking at a camp up in Colorado this summer. In fact, the week I was with Keith. And there was a guy who talked to me. He was a GI. Searched for God and religious fulfillment and spiritual fulfillment for years. And he said, I've never heard God speak to me in my whole life. And I said, you know, God comes and he speaks to you. as a still small voice mainly. There's many ways that God speaks in the Bible that are recorded there, but... I said, mainly, he injects his thoughts into your stream of consciousness. They occur to you. And a few minutes later, he was standing out on the front steps, and he was watching all the children bouncing up and down on the trampoline. And he said, God, speak to me. And all of a sudden, he saw flashing into his mind a picture of one of the children who had jumped too high and gone over and was diving head first into all of the coils of, of springs. And he just, he saw it happening all of a sudden in his mind's eye. And he lunged forward and he was standing there when that exact thing happened. And he came running back into the room to me and he said, he said, God did speak to me. God did speak to me. Just that very thing you said. It came not as words, but as a picture. And I, say, I said, well, okay, be encouraged if God can do that. I mean, I said, faith worketh through love. It's impossible to please God without faith. You've got to be expecting God to speak to you. Now, you've been going around saying God has never spoken to me in my life. Then I encouraged you a little bit. You had a little bit of faith. But faith worketh through love. You see, you love that little child. And that child was the focus of your attention. So God spoke to you. There was clear communication because there was love there. And I said, I'll tell you what. Now you go to work, walk in the woods and say, Father, what do you think of me? And you've been so tormented by your own intellect, saying, oh, I'm just hearing voices and this, that, and the You will know. You will know that you know that you know deep down in your spirit that your Heavenly Father is speaking to me. I got a knock on my door late that night. And he said, the man talked to me. I said, yeah, what did he say? He said, well, he said he loved me. And that he had a plan for my life. Now, we all know that God loves us and has a plan for life. Do we? We don't really. Not until we hear the voice of God. When we know it's Jesus that's come and we have walked in the garden alone. And we have fellowshiped and supped with him, you see. It's like that little private dinner engagement that's imagined. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man open unto me, I will come into him and sup with him. Hallelujah. Well, no matter how old you get, you're going to be a child. No matter how long you spent as a dependent child in that human family, you always have been and you always will be God's child. He's your real dad. You were briefly loaned to those human parents for a few years. Be loyal to them, love them and appreciate them. They were just kids like you that had a kid. But in the absence or failure of parental love, God steps in and has a covenant with you. He takes out the slack. He was there. He becomes the father to the fatherless. We have a little song we make our kids sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Why don't we sing that song today? It's not very sophisticated, is it? We feel more comfortable singing about our devotion to the Lord Jesus. But the greatest revelation we need to have is His love toward us. And to accept it, to rejoice in it, to revel in it. 
You know, the greatest portrait of peace and joy and contentment in the heart of God in the Bible, I think, is that passage in Zephaniah where it says, He will rest in His love. He will joy over us with singing. You know what kind of singing that is that God's describing? I believe it's the singing of a lullaby. You know, think of the greatest portrait of contentment and peace in our human context. Wouldn't it be a little baby that's just been breastfed and it's asleep in the arms of mother? That little child is just there. It's got a little glowing beatific look on its face. It's just there fast asleep. And mom is just rocking, you know. And there's a natural circumstance where a song of joy comes to the lips of a mother like that. There's a contentment in holding your little child. It's not squirming in your lap anymore. It's receiving your love, you see. It's receiving your love. And that creates great joy. You know, I've got a six-year-old boy now. He doesn't exactly hang around being hugged. But never now and again, he gets just tired enough so that he just kind of sprawls across my shoulder and I get to just hold him for a long time. Oh, that does my heart. Oh, maybe you're six now in the Lord. And maybe you want to run out with the other boys and plan on the kingdom. Maybe you're even falling in love with the bride and not the groom. <coughs> the work of the Lord and not the Savior. You see, there are two counterfeit lovers that can draw us aside for those of us who are involved in Christian ministry. One of them is busyness and the other one is introversion. Where we fall in love with our own selves in a spiritualized way. We talk about it this way. My growth in the Lord. My understanding of the Word. My development of my understanding of my gifts and callings. My knowledge of the Word of God. My overcoming habits and appetites. My relationships being right. You notice the word my is appearing there a lot? Mm -hmm. An introversion, a self-centeredness, a preoccupation with self, not a Jesus-centeredness. At Keith's funeral, I described him as a person that had looked into eternity and seen the goodness of God and fallen in love with the God of the universe. A Jesus-centered thought life not even a church or body-centered thought life, but a Jesus-centered thought life. If we walk and talk with Jesus, we will be transformed and we will affect those around us like Jesus would. But sometimes we become enamored with the plans of God, with the kingdom of God, with ministry. I love to be part of Youth of the Mission and I love to be a part of the world vision plans and projects that we're involved in. I love to get out maps and think about how to reach Asia. I love to think about those hundreds of teams out across the nations right now. I love to raise up structures of ministry to help the poor and the needy, to make plans, to buy buildings, to set up projects and organizations. And that can become a counterfeit lover. It really can. We say this, in, the absence, in absence the heart grows fonder. That's not true. Absence makes the heart grow fonder of somebody else. And if you're absent from your vital walking and talking relationship with Jesus as a daily part of your life, the main part of your life, then you will fall in love with a counterfeit lover. And temptation will assert itself again because fulfillment will not be there and so other fulfillments will assert themselves. Counterfeit fulfillments. They will. They will. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Let's sing that. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, they are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so.